Hello, I'm Timothy Lee. Thank you for watching. Today we celebrate 75 years since VE Day, a day of extraordinary memories. In this short video we'll be telling the stories of local people of Ingotston and Fryning, Margaretting, Mount Nessing, their memories of a day never to be forgotten. But first we need to go back to the dark years of the war. Six long years of struggle, years of the blitz, of death and hardship. Long years where people had to wait and pull through together. The outbreak of war on the 3rd of September 1939 was a day that Don Page of Ingotston remembers well. He was in the choir of a church in Collier Row. They'd heard something was up and at the end of the service the vicar produced a radio and everybody stayed to listen. The fateful news of the outbreak of war was given. The adults went home quite quickly in a sort of panic. He said, well we choir boys, we went for a cycle ride across the river before lunch. Well in the afternoon the sirens went off and everybody was running around looking for their gas mask. It was a false alarm and there was a phony war for many months to come. This was total war. Everyone was in it. It was everywhere. Not only on the battlefields, but in the valleys where Goronwy, the coal miner, carries his own weapons to his own battlefront in scenery which isn't exactly pretty. Brenda Pritchard from Mount Nessing says she remembers rationing, queuing and the air raid shelter. She says, my brother and I walked to the gas works in South Arrow to get coke. My brother pushed me there in a wheelbarrow, but I had to help push it home. The milkman had a horse and cart and we followed behind with a bucket and shovel. My dad worked for United Dairy so couldn't go to war and my father-in-law was a cobbler by trade and was not able to go to war either. If you looked across the countryside of England, that is beautiful. You could see Alan, the farmer. He has spent the last five years of war reclaiming the land and making it fertile. He has been fighting against the forces of nature all his life. And now, with a mortal enemy on us, he has to fight harder than ever. In France, the reality of Hitler's Blitzkrieg and Dunkirk was a brutal shock to the system. By a miracle and a lot of small boats, the British Army was evacuated and largely brought home safely. Averil Gorham of Billericay shares this with us. I remember going up to church with my mother and my brother was in the pram. Enemy planes were overhead and there was a dogfight in the air. There was a big ditch and we all went in, including the pram. I remember nobody being frightened. I remember the war being fun for a child. We played in the woods with ammunition and saw parachutes come down. There was a doodle bug at the end of Mount Nessing Road and the searchlight station was on the corner opposite St Giles Church. Val Burrett remembers. I lived in a shop at the top of Wally Hill and when the air raids went off we would walk to an underground shelter. A bomb dropped at the top of Wally Hill when I was walking home from school. My friend ran home to discover her house had been bombed out but her mother was still alive and she only recognised her mum by her hair. In London, Bill, the engine driver, looks out of his cabin at his battlefront. No longer taking holidaymakers to the sea, but taking the miners' coal, the farmers' crops, the fighting men's ammunition, to where they have to go. Goronwy, Allen and Bill are all fighting in their ways. But if you looked into the ward of a hospital, Tim, you would see some of the men who've been meeting the enemy direct. Civilians wounded by bombs, or soldiers wounded on land, or sailors at sea, or airmen, not as you will see them one day rushing through the sky at 500 miles an hour, but lying broken and still. Someone who remembered the raids was Phil Robbins, who now lives in Billericay. He said, when I was a child, we lived in, Ch in Chelsea. 
the daytime raids were first. One day I was out with my mum who was doing some shopping in the King's Road. The air raid sirens went off. There were public air raid shelters all around, but my mum had to get home, so we didn't stop. The sky above was full of German planes. I recognised the long, narrow fuselage of the Dorniers. There were dogfights going on above, and shrapnel and spent bullets raining down on us. The policemen wore tin helmets because of that. We got home, and my dad arrived soon after. He was off work early, as he was going on to the night shift as an emergency electrician. Anyway, he didn't expect to see us because the public air raid shelter for our block had been hit by a bomb, the water main had burst, and everyone was drowned. The nighttime raids kept people up all night. We couldn't sleep. Mum wouldn't go into our air raid shelter as she thought she might be buried alive. So we sometimes stopped in a passageway between the buildings where there was no glass. One night we were in bed counting the bombs coming down. The next one's ours, said Dad. It never came. Joyce Petty from Ingotstone said she joined the civil service the week before war was declared. She remembered at the height of the Blitz walking down Fleet Street. There were fires all down the street. It was an awful scene. When she got to the railway station, the platform was already full of people bedding down for the night. There was hardly any room to walk through to get to the train. The train came in and everything was dark. All the lamps had metal covers on them with the smallest of slits. Everything was dark. In 1942 she joined the Wrens, then went to Mill Hill to train. She was told there might be a special job for her, but she would have to go home and wait. So for three months she went home. Then one day a letter arrived. She was going to go away for a special job, very secret. A navy bus came for her with blacked out windows. They went on a long journey and eventually arrived at a lovely big house in the country. It was Bletchley Park. She worked in hut 11A, operating what was called the bomb. It was Britain's first big computer designed by Alan Turing. It was three banks high, ten across, covered with drums spinning away. It was used to simulate the rotors of the German Enigma machine so they could decipher messages being sent to the U-boats. Joyce made good friends there, girls she kept in touch with for the rest of their lives. She also had a sweetheart in the Navy. She said that although there was a war on, they always made an effort to talk about cheerful things. Phil Robbins said the buzz bombs carried a tonne of high explosive and caused a lot of damage. One night, he said, one stopped right over us. Everyone waited. The ground heaved and I was thrown out of bed. The front room was gone. After that, Mum said we couldn't stay. My parents had to work, but my sister Audrey and I had to go to Liverpool, as raids had stopped there by then. And we went to stay with my mum's employer in a huge house with 28 bedrooms, living in style. At Wellingale, there was an American Air Force base where they flew the B-26 Marauder Light Medium Bomber, which had a crew of six. This is Susie and her crew. In April 1944, Susie was out of action because of engine trouble. The fault was apparently fixed, and Susie took off for a test hop with three of her six crew on board. Lieutenant Henry Patrick, Sergeant Shanks, and Lieutenant Grunder. The engines cut out and the plane crashed near Ivy Barn Lane in Margaretting. All three crew were killed. Local man Alan Crouchman said that the pilot of the plane, Lieutenant Henry Patrick, had spent the previous Christmas staying with his grandmother and Henry regarded her as his English mother. She kept his photo, photo on the mantelpiece until the day she died. There was a terrible loss of life at the entrance to the Bethnal Green tube station on March the 3rd, 1943. Fred House, now living in Ingotston, was there. He said, I was returning home from army cadets on foot patrol. 
I came out to Bethnal Green Station. There was an air raid on at the time. Shrapnel was coming down like rain. The new rocket guns, recently stationed in Victoria Park, went off for the first time. They made a completely different sound, a swoosh and a bang, which caused a stampede. When I got to the tube station, it seemed to be a mass of arms and legs, and I thought it looked a bit dodgy, and I better not go in. Later, I heard about the disaster. It seemed that as the crowd rushed into the tube station, somebody at the, tripped to the bottom of the stairs and everybody fell down on top of that person. In no time, there were hundreds of people squashed down there and people arriving all the time. 178 people died on that day. Fred's brother and father were among the people taking the bodies out later and one of his relations died as well. The government censored news reports of this story. Robert Fletcher of Ingotson tells the story of Margaretting man Bert Holmes, a popular member of the Ingotson Boys Own Club. He was a rear gunner in Lancaster. This picture was taken at REF Water Beach in Cambridgeshire with 514 Squadron. They were on a mission to Valenciennes in France near the Belgian border to bomb the railway yards. However, they were intercepted by German fighters and the plane was hit on the wing by machine gun fire. The pilot desperately tried to raise the nose, but to no avail, so he gave the order to the crew to bail out. Only the navigator got out. Bert and five others were buried at the Crassiel Cemetery near Arras there. The local French mayor recorded that at the funeral there were 2,800 local people present presumably the entire population of the village. The wrong way back to his mind, back to everyday life and everyday danger. This doesn't look like beach combing. The British 2nd Army and the American 9th, under the command of Field Marshal Montgomery, are crossing the Rhine in what appears to be the biggest land and air operation since D-Day. As the danger of invasion was now over, the Home Guard was stood down. Here is the photo of the stock Home Guard in which the father of Robert Fletcher of Ingotston was a member and his certificate of thanks as the unit was stood down. And here's the new year. What's going to happen in 1945 and in the years to follow when we are not here and you are? During that awful autumn and winter, Tim, we had been in the dark almost as much as you. But about the middle of January, we began to see something was coming. Perhaps something tremendous. Marshal Stalin has announced a great offensive in southern Poland. In two days, it's broken through the long-prepared enemy defences on a front of 40 miles to a depth of nearly 25. The country had to wait until the 8th of May, 1945, for VE Day. Liz Bowen, who was 10 on VE Day and lived in London, remembers the huge bonfire in the evening. The bonfire was stacked up to fill the whole width of the road. As it burned, there was a real sense of brightness and colour after so many years of drabness. As the bonfire burned down, the men dared each other to leap over the embers. Her dad suddenly realised his gold-propelling pencil was missing, a gift from Liz's mother, so he was frantically searching the embers to find it. Fortunately, he found it without any scorch mark on it. The children had to go to bed, but next day they were up early to see if the fire was still going. It was not, but all the tarmac had burned away, leaving a big hole in the road. Phil Robbins remembered that VE Day celebrations carried on for quite a few days. One day he said, my mum said she wanted to see the celebrations, so he went on the underground to Trafalgar Square. It was full of people. There were lights on. I was only nine, so I didn't even know there were such things as street lights. We went to St James Park and there were fireworks, or there may have been flares. I'd never seen those before. 
Mari Davison of Ingotstone remembers that VE Day she was nine years old, staying in North London in Bounds Green with her aunt. They had a cafe in Holborn. Alexandra Palace was not far away, so they got a bus and walked there. It was evening. It was totally crowded. There were bonfires and fireworks, music and laughter. As a child, she said, I felt a bit overwhelmed as everyone was much taller than me. Everyone was singing and forming long lines to dance the conga and I joined in. It was all very noisy and everyone was very excited. Okay, the other day they went up on the tube to Trafalgar Square. Mari's cousin Victor, now in Australia, remembers someone on the tube train letting off a firework. It was bright daylight when they got there, but there was still a sense of a big party going on. People were making hay in the fountains, he said, all over them. Back in North London a few days later, the council switched on the street lights. After the darkness, everything seemed so bright. They walked along the high street, reveling in the strange orange light shining on their faces. David Avery of Ingotston said that Dad was a bell ringer, and for the first time in a very long time, the joyous sound of the six bells of St Edmund and St Mary's rang out across the village. The bells rang for what seemed a very long time. Dad was away even longer and Mum said that she, she thought he was enjoying a well-deserved pint of beer in one of the local pubs with the rest of the bell ringing team. The relief that the war in Europe had come to an end was palpable and people walked around with wide grins on their faces. Secret stocks of whiskey suddenly appeared and people invited neighbours into their homes for celebratory drinks. I remember our lounge being full of happy conversation and laughter as people realised that at long last it was all over. People in Ingotston had street parties in areas such as Norton Road and the Meads. Tables and chairs were brought from people's homes and they brought what food and drink they could spare. Everything was rationed of course and the spread was sparse in comparison to today. But as children it was great for us to sit in the middle of the road and eat tea. Rationing did not end with the end of the war. It continued until the early 1950s. The local branch of the British Legion held a celebratory dance in the Working Men's Club Hall. Some time later the Legion held a gala day in Transport Meadow and the Dagenham Girl Pipers were the star attraction. The high street was lined by hundreds of people to watch them march from the post office to Transport Meadow. In Mount Nessing, also, they had their own celebrations. Joyce Petty had been redeployed towards the end of the war as a marine wren to Stanmore. On VE Day, they had the day off, so they all went into London. There were vast crowds there, everyone so happy. It had been six years of war. There were soldiers up lampposts and people milling around everywhere. She and her friends decided to go to Buckingham Palace and they got right up to the railings. Joyce had to wait until July for her sweetheart to get home from the Navy. They were married the following spring. Christine Lemon of Mount Nessing was living in Goodmays at the time. She says we were up early and after breakfast walked to Seven Kings bus garage in the high road. We boarded a special bus which took us all the way to Victoria. Sitting upstairs on the double decker, we sensed both joy and sadness. Surrounding us on all sides was devastation, demolished buildings, scattered debris. But countering this were bright red, white and blue flags, bunting and streamers fluttering in the wind. From Stratford, the brilliance, the crowds and the noise all became more and more intense. Leaving the bus at Victoria, we made our way through the crowded streets to the mall, getting as close to Buckingham Palace as we could. Uniforms, decorated horses and instruments glittered in the sun as various groups paraded past. Everywhere the crowds sang and danced. At last, the King and Queen, other members of the royal family and Winston Churchill, appeared on the balcony. As aeroplanes thundered overhead and trumpets sounded, we joined in the effervescent cheering and waved our Union Jacks to swell the sea of red, white and blue in which we were immersed. I don't remember the return journey, 
but what a spectacular and memorable day. Some words of Geoffrey Fullerton, Rector of Ingatestone and Buxbury at the time. Our Register of Services records that on May the 8th, Victory Day, there were approximately 700 persons present at the three acts of thanksgiving and that the following Sunday there were 850 persons present during the day. This makes May 1945 a memorable month in the history of our parish church. But of what can be recorded in print, we must add the thankfulness and relief felt in the hearts of all for the safety of dear ones hitherto in danger, the safe return of our prisoners in Germany, not to mention the passing of our own lesser dangers at home.